Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Today I'd like to introduce you to Chiho Keniko. She's on our board of directors here at Fairwinds Energy and she just got back from a really interesting trip to Japan. And I'd like to have you understand the problems that the people in Japan are having who have been evacuated from their villages and are now asked to return. So welcome, Chiho. Hi, Arnie. It's nice to see you again. Hundreds of thousands of people were asked to leave the accident scene and, and move to temporary housing, and now they're being asked to return. Can you tell us about the one village where uh, we have a, an example, a case history, if you will? Okay. It is a, a village of Kawauchi, which is um, located um, southwest of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And I would say the closest part um, to the reactor the, of the town village is about 12 miles from the reactor reactors. So these people didn't stay in the town. They were one of the first people to be evacuated. And where did they go to and how long were they there? Well, depending on the person, of course, some people who had um, relatives that, that they can uh, rely on might have stayed with, you know, those relatives, uh, say, in the Tokyo area or whatever. But a lot of them, well, the, the village basically uh, helped people uh, live in temporary housing units uh, located in Koryama, city of Koryama, which is in Fukushima, um, about 40 miles uh, west of Fukushima Daiichi. So they got evacuated from 12 miles away to 40 miles away and uh, they were put up where? It's a temp temporary sort of a prefabricated uh, units of uh, residential sort of um, you know buildings and uh, just a uh, small rooms. Uh, they're just a uh, like a rows of homes uh, all you know put up quickly uh, on the parking lot uh, next to a big convention center. Um, it almost sounds like the FEMA housing after Hurricane Katrina. I've never seen FEMA housing myself, but I think I imagine some, it's something like that. Yeah. So, how long were they there, and when did they, were they asked to return? Well, it's almost uh, three years since the accident took place, and um, so people were evacuated on March. I think by March 16th, everybody had to get out of the village. And um, temporary units were built some months later, you know, um, since then. But then a lot of people left um, the, the, um, the temporary units, but then some people are still there, uh, especially uh, the older peop generation, older people, because, um, you know, young people might find their own apartment to live um, with, maybe with their family. But then older people, well, they don't have a work, um, and they don't have means of transportation, so they just stayed. So let me just say that that's five days after the accident, and these people still lived 12 miles away from the, from, from the plant. And then they were asked to move after five that's days. That's right. That's right. How sad. You know, I was on CNN saying that people should be evacuated, you know, three or four days after the accident. Right. So, the um, the the family unit has been disturbed. There, there were you know, young people, middle-aged people, old people, all living together in this village, and then they were were forced to evacuate for 40 miles away to a um, to basically prefabricated housing that was thrown up pretty quickly. What did they do to the family units? Young people, especially with small children, young families with small children. They have a lot of um, concerns for returning to the, uh, um, you know, their old village, even though the place is now officially um, declared that you know it's safe to return, go back to, um, because um, it was uh, about two years ago. The village of Kawauchi was the first one to be deemed safe to return. So I'd like to put that in perspective. The Japanese say that you can return to your village when the dose drops to 20 millisieverts per year. Now, that, that's 2,000 millirem per year. The average worker in a nuclear plant gets 500 millirem per year. 
And they're getting paid to absorb that radiation. So what the Japanese have done is said that it's okay to go back to your village when the exposure is four times higher than what the average worker in an American nuclear plant ever gets. Plus, I think on top of that, we, that's just the um, you know, external radiation. But if you take into account the um, other sources of radiation um, exposure from you know, internal exposure, like through food or by breathing, then the cumul cumulative sort of radiation uh, exposure on your body is much, much higher than that. You know, Chiho, Ferens did a long story about the exposures that people in Fukushima City were receiving from hot particles way back in 2011. We, we took a look at the um, the concentration of radioactivity on kids' sneakers. And they were loaded with contamination. And you know if it's on their sneakers, it's on their hands, and it's in their mouth. And then on top of that, we took a look at the contamination in car air filters from Fukushima City. And those fil air filters were just loaded with hot particles. A car engine it breathes in about the same amount of air as a person. There was a person sitting in that car whose lungs are as bad as that car air filter. So it's not just this 2,000 millirem that's coming up from the ground. What's really important is about what kind of hot particles these people are breathing in. And the IAEA and the Japanese government is not analyzing that. So Chiyo, here's my question. When the people go back into this village, what kind of village are they going back to? What kind of infrastructure is still there? Basically, the whole uh, fabric of the community that they used to rely on um, is no longer there. S the infrastructure, well, the roads are there, buildings are still there, but the community is no longer there. And also, you know, the, maybe they were going, um, going for shopping or the medical uh, you know, care in a neighboring villages and towns. Well, maybe those are no longer available to them because some of the, those in you know, hospitals and things are maybe in the evacuation zone still. And also, you know, if young people are not uh, willingly going back to the village, that means older people are just living on their own. That means you know, they don't have people helping um, them you know, to do those uh, daily um, sort of uh, uh, going around, so, you know, making hospital appointments. So it, it is, uh, it's not quite as simple as, okay, well, you know, your house is still there. Maybe three years after, you know, s some of the rodent intrusions and whatever, then so house might need a little repair, but you can go back. Well, it's not quite as simple. Um, actually, I said, you know, a little bit of rodent intrusion. I mean, it's, it can be actually quite a serious thing. Be, you know, after being neglected for two years, three years, you know, maybe your plumbing is not working anymore or roofs leaking. You know, those things happen all the time. So it costs a lot of money to repair those in order to resume living there again. So that's another thing. But um, even without that, um, you know, the whole uh, support structure uh, in your life is no longer there. If you're a young grandparent, it's likely that your kids and your grandkids didn't come back to your village. So as a grandparent, you're coming back to something that's basically like a ghost town. It might not be ghost town per se because the uh, village, uh, you know, government decided that they're going to go back. So a lot of our village workers are there. So there are some people who are living there. Uh, in the case of Kawauchi, I understand that the um, just over 500 people out of, say, uh, was 3,200 uh, original population have returned. The issue of um, financial uh, struggles because, um, you know, older people don't have uh, sort of income other than, say, just limited um, pension or something or social security. And they used to rely on food that came from their own land, that the food that they grew themselves. I mean, some people say, I had never bought a bag of rice in my life until the accident happened. It was their birthright to grow their own food and just 
you know, they didn't have a lot of money, but they, at least they had that food security. But now they can no longer grow their own food. Well, if especially if they're living in those temporary units, they can't grow their own food, period, and to just feed themselves. So everything they have to buy from the store, everything requires money, and they don't have that money because the uh, compensation that, that they used to get while they've been evac you know, it, it was an officially evacuation zone. And a, f a few months after that, they were getting some government compensation. I think it was um, uh, just about $1,000 uh, per month per person. But that's no longer there. It's cut off. So these people that were forced to evacuate are now in a situation where they're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. When they were evacuated, they got a stipend to live in the temporary housing. But now that their village has been declared clean, they can go back. And if they don't go back, they lose the stipend. But if they do go back, the ground is still so contaminated that they can't grow the vegetables they relied on to live there in the first place. That doesn't seem fair. Or they don't have the sort of um, social support structure that they used to have. I'm aware of this term called the Fukushima divorce. What that means is that the women take their children and leave, but the husband believes the Japanese government and decides to stay behind. So I imagine that that's got to leave the village without the young voices, without the kids singing, and without the, the women's voices. To me, a village without those noises would be incredibly sad. In a way, chil some people say children are the future, you know? Also, if, if you have a community without children, does that mean that the community doesn't have the future? In the Japanese cultural tradition, respect for your ancestors is awfully important. There are cemeteries with generation after generation of your ancestors in these villages that are left behind. Can you talk for a minute about the link between the children representing the future and the ancestors representing the past? Well, you know, it's very difficult to um, abandon the place where, you know, you have tens Ten generations of uh, um, you know your family lived um, over say three hundred years, four hundred years. It's difficult to just give up on the land, and you know, even though you know deep down that the place is contaminated, it's no longer this pristine uh, land. It is emotionally very difficult. So I do sympathize with that. You know the the people's sort of a need to feel maybe it's okay to go back. And on top of that, there's the constant fear that comes from hearing the clicks of your radiation detector, always reminding you that your health is in jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it's the thing is, there is also the um, um, people Unless you see in numbers, you know, in Geiger counter, you actually don't feel anything to some extent. Um, so it's easy to get fooled that, well, maybe it is actually okay, you know, to live here, to be here, even though the reality might be otherwise. The Japanese government is leaving these people with absolutely no choice. That's the thing that I hear over and over from people in Fukushima, that uh, they wish they could choose. They were given a choice between or among, you know, different options, such as, well, there are some certain people who really need to go back because, you know, especially old, I mean, you know, people who feel they are too old to really, um, worried about radiation, but that they need to just die in their home or whatever. There are people like that. Or there are others, you know, young people, well, I cannot let my children have uh, run the risk of, uh, you know, maybe having cancer, you know, 10 years down the road. People have different needs, and people want the choice. Um, 
people and government to support their choice, whichever, whatever they choose. But right now, there is only one way to support, which is to either stay in Fukushima or return to Fukushima. So there's a lot of programs and money being um, you know, sort of poured into Fukushima to support um, people, both mentally, financially, physically, um, just to you know, uh, get back to Fukushima or just stay there. But then if people want to sort of uh, leave the area and start their life somewhere, there is absolutely no support. Chihio, I want to thank you for the perspective and the insight you bring to Fairwinds and to this broadcast about the problems that are faced every day by people living in the prefecture of Fukushima in Japan. I'm Arnie Gunderson. I'll keep you informed.